Well, hello, my name's Louise Savage of Louise Savage Muses. Welcome back if you're returning to view my channel again and welcome if you haven't visited me before in my lovely library. Um, so I've had a, another really interesting reading month, a real sort of hodgepodge um, of different books of all sorts of genres and types. So without further ado, I'm going to dive in because there's quite a few of them. Um, so the first book I read in, gosh, what month is it? February? <laughs> Can't even think. Um, was um, Sarah Hall's Sudden Traveller. I don't think I've read anything by Sarah Hall before. And this is a, a lovely collection of short stories. And um, I think the short story genre is so difficult to write. Um, even fabulous authors, you know, I can love them. And then they produce a short story collection and I'm left cold. The most recent one that, that had that effect on me was the collection that Hilary Mantel Mantel um, wrote. I can't remember the title, something to do with Margaret Thatcher. Um, but anyway, um, this did not disappoint. And I thought this was a real masterpiece, actually, because within this very, very slim volume, there is um, a whole range of genres settings, characters. Um, each story is very distinctly different and very clever. Um, there were probably two that, that really stayed with me. Um, one was a, a story of a woman who had a heart condition and she'd been fitted with a pacemaker and she travelled to Cumbria and was sitting on a bench and basically she'd been fitted with this pacemaker that gave her the facility to press a button, um, speak to somebody and decide that this was going to be the moment that she chose to end her life. And I thought that was a really fascinating idea and it was pursued beautifully. Um, the other story that, that I really loved was one that was set in Turkey and um, it's told from the perspective of a, a man who's probably in late middle age, I guess, and he's he stood on a beach and he's watching two young women um, in bikinis. Um, and it's a little bit weird because you don't know why he's watching. He thinks he recognises one of them. Um, and I'm not going to spoil it because there's a fantastic... I, I certainly didn't see the story going in the direction that it went in. So I thought that was brilliant as well. So yeah, just a fantastic, every sort of genre, every style. Uh, yeah, a really lovely, um, pleasant surprise, actually. I don't, I don't, I hadn't expected anything from this. And um, I really, really enjoyed it. Next up, I'm not going to talk about this for very long because I, I think I did a separate um, vlog on it. Can't quite remember now. Uh, but anyway, this is this. Yes, I did, because I did one about graphic novels. That's right. And this prompted it. Um, so this is Simon Morton's Ware. It's uh, very personal to me, I suppose, because it's set on the wonderful um, Clee Hill, which um, Titterson Clee, which is not very far from where I live. Um, and it's Simon Morton telling the story of his father's death and how he dealt with grief. Um, but but also telling the story of that fantastic landscape, and I walk there a lot. So, you know, for me, it was it was just brilliant to have that all brought to life in a way that that I wasn't expecting. Um, and also lots of sort of stories about that landscape, the history, and and so on that I I hadn't been aware of. Some of them I had, but but not in as much detail. Um, so I loved that. It's called Where. Um, now this novel, something very different. So this is um, Arundhati Roy. Uh, she won the Booker Prize, didn't she, years ago for, oh my goodness, I am, I don't know what's going on. I've, I've been cleaning cars, which isn't something that I normally do. Maybe it's addled my brain um, in the cold. So maybe I've got brain freeze. I don't know. Uh, God of Small Things. There we are. It came to me. That's what Arundhati Roy wrote. And she won the, I think it was the Booker Prize for that. Um, but this is a novel called The Ministry of Utmost Unhappiness. And I am so glad I read this book. It's not an easy read in the sense that I think it's, 
I feel like her writing often is, well, she is an academic and she writes a lot of non-fiction and she's a voice. Uh, she speaks out a lot about, you know, the politics of India. Um, so, you know, it, it's quite a dense, um, complex novel. And I found that I was having to look a lot of things up as I was reading it, which I quite enjoy, but it's not necessarily what everybody wants to be doing. So there's an awful lot of Indian vocabulary in here where it's assumed that you know what the word means. And I think that's absolutely fair enough. You know, she's a writer from that part of the world. I don't have a problem with that. Um, but I did find I was having to stop and look things up because although the context usually made it clear, it wasn't always clear. Um, so anyway, this, this um, novel focuses on, well, there are several characters who play distinctive parts in it but I suppose the lead character is um, called Andrum and Andrum is born um, transsexual so but already the mother has four daughters and so she she decides that Andrum's gender is going to be male um, partly out of fear I think of what might happen because she's producing all these daughters and um, but Andrum um, doesn't necessarily feel totally comfortable as a male. And when Andrum is quite young, I think about eight or nine, maybe a bit older, Andrum sees this Hydra. Now, a Hydra is a, 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 a man who dresses as a female um, and um, identifies as female and um, Andrum is absolutely fascinated by the Hydras, follows this Hydra, finds out where they live and decides that that's what he wants to become. Um, and so he becomes Andrum because before that he has a different name. Um, and so it's wonderful because it, it really looks at the politics of gender, attitudes towards gender. Hydras have been a part and parcel of uh, Indian culture for centuries. Um, and yet, even, you know, in this contemporary era, I thought it was fascinating because you, you go inside the house with these hydras and there is this conflict between the generations. So the younger generation are calling themselves something different. You know, that word hydra now has a loaded meaning in the same way, I suppose, that words like gay um, have been um, repossessed, as it were, or... or um oh i can't think of the right words honestly the cold um yeah no i found that whole sort of attitude really really interesting and um there were so many things about this novel the scope of it is huge so a lot of it is to do with um the partition um you know with with pakistan and the impacts of that as well so it, it's a really good grounding in terms of you know, Kashmir and um, the, the political dichotomy there. And one of the things that Roy does is, she, you know, she's she's very openly critical of um, Indian leadership and the inability or the um, lack of concern in terms of grasping all of that. Um, so we've got a character in it who uh, called Tilo, who is a, a a female architect that's really interesting she has two men in her life one of whom is a very mysterious character called Musa and he is a freedom fighter um and and you you sort of follow her story very closely um there's also this amazing cat I mean th this is what I love is just the 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 clever wonderful ideas in here so there's one there's one character called Saddam Hussein and he's very young when um Andrew meets him and she asks him, what, why, you know, what an unusual name. Why are you called Saddam Hussein? And he says he chose it himself. And she's, why, why, did, you know, why did you choose to be named after such a horrific um, dictator? And he says, well, I saw a video of him being executed and I was impressed by his bravery he didn't don't think he really knew who he was and so he decided to call and, and I love that kind of whole that seems such an alien perspective um 
and, and a kind of innocent perspective on um on this this you know horror horror of the the 21st century um Anjum eventually ends up living in a graveyard that's all rather wonderful and it reminded me quite a bit of uh, Elif Shafak's um 10 minutes and how many seconds uh, novel that she she uh, published a, a fair few years ago now um so yeah it brought me a lot of joy and um and and there's there is some sense of probably some sense of hope in this certainly it's a, a story of persistence and resilience but there's an awful lot of tragedy as well um and yeah I feel wiser for reading this book I feel better informed I don't know whether I've been able to express that very well to you today but there we are I I, I recommend it but as I say if if you somebody who likes looking things up and blah 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 um there we go and then again, I'm not going to talk about this one too much because um, it was my pick for this month's um, Savage Prompts. And um, so I've already uh, produced a video on it, um, but it's The Bass Rock by Evie Wilde. Um, she won the Stella Prize for this book, which is the Australian version of the Women's Prize. Um, I've been looking forward to reading this for a long time because it was one that Simon Savage bashed on about. Um, and I wasn't disappointed. Um, I loved the portrayal of uh, a, a newly married woman who is really struggling to come to terms with not only her her marriage, but also she's married to somebody who's been widowed. And um, so she takes on his two sons and a lot of the novel is devoted to her relationship with them, which I found really interesting, maybe because I'm a stepmother myself. Um, and um, and also lots of things in here about her relationship with her sister and also um, a really interesting relationship she forms with a stranger who becomes a very close friend. So I like this novel for its relationships. Um, it spans three different time periods and I found certainly the, the, the story in the 17th century a little bit out of kilter. I, 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 I wouldn't have minded if that hadn't been there. I, I didn't feel it added anything for me to the novel. Um, and also just wonderful landscapes and, and a, a fantastic old house to kind of roam around in. So lots, lots to recommend this. Um, and then um, I read Memphis by Tara M. Stringfellow. And um, I don't think this is her first book, but I've certainly not read anything by her before. Um, and it's, as it says on the tin, it's set in Memphis in America. Um, I really enjoyed reading this. It's a story that's told over three generations of women. Again, you know, similarly to the Bass Rock in that sense. Um, and, and again, women who've been subjected to, uh, or at least um, two of them, to domestic, well, three of them actually, to, to domestic violence. Um, so the novel opens with Miriam, who is driving in her car, and she has two two daughters in the back and she is escaping from her husband who has become increasingly violent he is a uh, in the american military he's um been honored um high ranking um and black which of course is perhaps more usual now but not so usual at the time that the novel's set um and so it explores um her violence uh, not her violence, his violence towards her. Um, it's also a novel um, which focuses on Miriam's mother, um, who uh, was married to um, the first black policeman in Memphis. And he comes to a very sticky end, um, which again, I don't want to, to, to produce any spoilers, but... Um, so I thought, for me, that was fascinating, the idea of these two black males who'd been in these, you know, what we, what we would conventionally see as very respectable professions, um, but actually the impact of those professions was was really, really negative. So where does that leave you in terms of aspiration? Um, but it was more about the impact on the women. So um, so Hazel, the, the eldest woman in the three generations, who's the mother of Miriam, um, she can, manages to continue to live um, in the house that her husband built for her. And it's this, this amazing, huge, 
uh, rambling, very grand house. Um, and so that's where Miriam has grown up. So she is fleeing from um, her husband back back home, basically. And she hasn't been back there for, for some years. And um, her sister now lives there, um, August, uh, who has her own hair salon, very enterprising woman. Um, but you know there's something really alarming when the door opens and Miriam's daughter, Joan, her elder daughter, sees August's son, Derek, and it's clear that something really horrendous happened in that house when they last visited, which was when um, Joan was three years old. There's something that's happened between her and Derek, which is horrible. So this is not a, a novel for the faint-hearted at all. I love the resilience of the women. I love the fact that there is hope in this novel, even though um, all the women suffer. Um, I really enjoyed, again, I love relationships between sisters. Um, and and the way that Miriam's, Miriam's attitude towards her husband is not straightforward. Um, I thought that was very realistically portrayed. So I th again, a lot to recommend this. Um, and, and I felt it captured sort of the, the tension, the the claustrophobia of perhaps living in some somewhere a, a city like this um so yeah really really thoroughly and completely recommend this novel and then finally i went back to 1979 well i sort of did i sort of went back to 1982 um which was the year that that my son simon was born and in that year i saw um a film called sophie's choice uh starring Meryl Streep for which she won an Academy Award and this novel by William Styron um, is the novel that the film was based on. So this novel came out um, I think in 1979 and I've never read it and I was always really intrigued. That film had a huge impression on me. I mean I was, I was still quite young and um, I don't think I knew an awful lot about the Holocaust, um, about Auschwitz um, and so it it really opened my eyes because when I was at school, we studied, you know, we didn't study the war um, at all, which seems weird now, doesn't it? It was all Napoleon and things like that. Um, so uh, although I did read the first World War, war Poets, but of course this is the Second World War, isn't it? Anyway, um, so Sophie's Choice. So Sophie is a young woman very beautiful. She um, survives Auschwitz and ends up in Brooklyn um, in New York and the story is told by Stingo who is a 22 year old male um, and he moves into um, a, the Pink Palace which is this uh, rooming house in boarding house in a, in Brooklyn and um, he uh, has given up his job, he's trying to write a novel, he's very naive in, in lots of ways um, and Sophie and Nathan both live in the boarding house as well in separate rooms but it soon becomes very apparent that they're conducting this very torrid um, love affair, very up and down um very distressing sometimes he's incredibly violent towards sophie um and stingo becomes really close friends with the two of them so it's almost it's not quite a love well is it a love triangle in some ways it is um because he's kind of obsessed with both of them he's equally fascinated but he falls helplessly in love with sophie um and as the novel progresses various aspects of sophie's backstory become apparent to Stingo, mainly told through her, but sometimes told to him by Nathan. Um, and one of the things that, that's fascinating about this novel is that Sophie, you kind of assume that Sophie might be Jewish, but actually she's not. She's Polish and she's Catholic. Um, and Styron did that very deliberately. He was trying to, to make the point that um, the Holocaust was not solely about the destruction of the Jews but also 
there were other minority groups who um, were pursued as well. Um, I found this novel really fascinating. I mean, it's a, a real commitment. It's over 600 pages long and it took me quite a long time to read. Um, but I'm glad I've read it. You can see by my hesitation that it's it, it's left me with a lot of conflicts because I think the characters in this novel are so well drawn. Um, you really, really get to know them. And that's one of the wonderful things, isn't it, about having a novel of this length. Um, I also really enjoyed the kind of time frame of it, that you're seeing it through Nathan uh, Stingo's eyes and he's gradually making sense of it all. And some of his relationships as well, like he has a, the most lovely um, relationship with his father, um, which you don't always see in, in fiction, you know, a very sort of positive relationship. Um, he's trying to write a novel, but the downside of it is that the attitudes towards women I found very difficult to read in 2023. Um, Sophie is completely objectified. Um, she's beautiful and that seems to be almost part of her personality rather than, um, you know, something separate from that. Um, she, he, Stingo is absolutely obsessed with her body. So every few pages you get references to her backside or her breasts or whatever it might be. And I, and I found that really, um, detracted from my enjoyment of the novel. I mean, he is 22, he's completely sex obsessed. That's very, very apparent. And, and he doesn't shy away from that. But there was just way too much sex in the book for me. Um, and I, I, I couldn't really justify it apart from it sort of showing his, his innocence and lack of experience. Um, a lot of the young women in it are represented as frigid because they won't, um, you know, he's not successful in managing to, to sleep with any of them. So again, that, that I, you know, I felt that was uncomfortable, but, but equally, I suppose we have to remember, I have to remember that this was a novel that was written in the seventies when attitudes, unfortunately, were very different to mine. Um, and, and actually in some ways reading it was, was quite positive because I thought in lots of ways, excuse me, things have changed. I think attitudes to this now, if it was published, would be very different. Whereas it was on the whole celebrated, it won all sorts of awards and things when it was published. Um, the other thing about the novel it, that made me uncomfortable was the way that Stingo makes comparisons between the Holocaust and um, the American institution of slavery, which, again, you know, he 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 doesn't just intimate; he states that that slavery was you know, not as bad, doesn't seem as bad when set against the background of the Holocaust. And I, and I found that really tricky to get my head around as well. Um, one of the things the novel does do is it explores um, the psychology of the characters uh, in quite an interesting way. And, and one of the characters is bipolar. Um, and I suspect that's something that hadn't been written about very much um, at the time. Um, so yeah, I, I, on balance, I'm really glad I read it, um, but it comes with some hesitation um, because of the reasons that I've just stated. Interestingly, the, the novel was banned as well in South Africa, um, and I don't think it was ever explained why. I know Styron himself thought it was to do with it being sexually explicit, but I think it's I think that's really interesting and and also it was banned in Poland as well which was of course um communist at the time and I think in Russia so it's had quite a checkered history this novel um so yeah if you do if you have read it or you um you go on and read it I'd be very interested to know what you think because it's left me feeling very um divided really in in my response to it and I, I do think in some ways it is a in some ways it's a masterpiece um but it's just that that yeah just left me feeling a little bit uncomfortable 
Um, I'm being reminded of just how awful in some ways the 70s were. Anyway, there we are. That's my um, wonderful reading um, from this month of February. Um, I hope you've all had fantastic reading months as well. I'm off to choose um, a book to read for my March prompt, which I think is a choose a book with your favourite colour on the cover. So, um, yeah, I'm looking for something. Oh, I don't know, because I'm, I'm a fan of turquoise and I'm a fan of orange. Oh, dear. I'm going to have to see what I've got on my shelves, aren't I? Anyway, take care, everybody. See you soon. Bye.